Hey, what is up people? Welcome back. You survived unit one. Now it's time to really start macro. So let's go. And be sure to smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. Okay, so maybe my last comment has you like, uh, what do you mean? We just did a unit of macro. And that's true. But unit one was basically like laying the groundwork learning the basic but very important concepts that are in the background of the rest of the course. Now we get into macro more specifically. Macroeconomics attempts to study the economy as a whole, primarily through three main measurements, GDP, unemployment, and inflation. In other words, how much stuff we're producing, the state of the job market, and how much the stuff costs. This unit is all about introducing you to each of these measures, learning how to calculate them, as well as considering the limitations of each one. Before we get to GDP, we're actually gonna start with the circular flow diagram. The circular flow diagram is basically a simplified model of the economy, and it displays two groups, households and firms, and shows how they interact in two types of markets, product and factor markets. So let's break this thing down. Households refer to people like you and me, and firms is the word that we use for companies or businesses. I want you to focus on the outer set of arrows and notice that households own the factors of production and that they sell them to firms in the factor market, aka the resource market. I know you just got excited because you're like, hey, I remember factors of production from unit one. Feels good, doesn't it? Now, more specifically, the three factors of production we're talking about here are land, labor, and capital. Households supply these resources to the factor market where they're bought by firms. Why do firms demand the factors of production? Because they use these factors to create final goods and services that households buy in product markets. If you turn your attention to the inner arrows pointing the other direction, you'll get the rest of the picture. Why do households supply their labor to firms in the factor market? Because firms pay them to do so. Why do firms supply final goods and services in the product market? Because households pay them. You'll also notice in this model that total spending is equal to total income. All money spent by households becomes income for firms, and money spent by firms is income for households. All right, so let's turn our attention to the main event, GDP. GDP stands for Gross Domestic Product and measures the total value of all final goods and services produced in an economy in a given time period. Hooray for super wordy definitions. But let's break this down, and it's really not too bad. First, focus on the word final. Final goods are used by a consumer. They're the final product. This word is important because intermediate goods are not counted in GDP. These are goods that are inputs used to make the final good. Imagine you buy a shirt. That's the final good. The ink, the dye, the cotton, the buttons, all those things are intermediate goods. Next, notice that the goods are produced in a given period. Normally the time period is a year, so we're looking at when something is produced. This means that used goods don't contribute to GDP. GDP is basically the granddaddy of all macro measurements as it shows us how productive our economy is in any given year, and most of the things we do this year will be run through the lens of exploring how it will affect GDP. Now, there are actually three ways to calculate GDP, so that's our next job, learning how to calculate GDP. By far the most important way is known as the expenditures approach, which adds up total spending in the economy. Y equals C plus I plus G plus XN. Now that's a whole bunch of variables right there, so let's go through each of them and define them. C is for consumer spending or consumption. This is money spent by households on goods and services. I is for investment spending. And I have to tell you, investment spending is one of, if not the most important concepts in all of macro. It refers primarily to the purchase of new physical capital, such as tools, machinery, factories, and new construction more broadly. This is hugely important because this is what drives productivity gains and economic growth. While consumer spending is primarily spending by households, investment spending is primarily done by businesses. G is for government spending, which is when the government buys goods and services. Now, please note that the government has to receive a good or service, like, I don't know, bombs or road construction or soldiering, for it to be counted as GDP. When the government gives away tax dollars to somebody, that does not count as GDP. 
And X in is net exports, or the difference between exports and imports. Exports refer to domestic goods being sold in other countries, and they add to GDP, while imports refer to foreign goods being bought in the domestic country, and they reduce GDP. So if exports is greater than imports, this number will be positive and add to GDP, while if imports are greater than exports, the number will be negative and will reduce GDP. And that just leaves the letter Y, which refers to a handful of terms that are basically interchangeable. First, it refers to real GDP, which we'll discuss soon in video 2.6. It can also be referred to as national income and aggregate spending. Aggregate basically means total, so like the circular flow shows us, total income equals total spending. Now with the most important method settled, let's take a look at the other ways of calculating GDP. The second method is known as the income approach, and instead of focusing on total spending, it takes the four ways people earn income and adds them up. Y equals wages plus rent plus interest plus profits. Wages are income earned for labor, rent is income earned from land, interest is income earned from capital, and profits are income earned from entrepreneurship. Would you look at that? It's our factors of production coming back once again. The final and least used method in AP Macro is the value added approach, in which you basically add up the values of the intermediate goods that were used in the making of a final good, and you calculate the value added by each firm along the way, and it can look something like this, where we add up the value added by each firm in the production of something. In this example, it's a shirt. And so look at the second firm. They buy $1 worth of cotton and then add ink and dye and sell what they've done to the next firm for $3. So the value that this firm added was $2, three minus one. Now the third firm pays $3 for the inputs and adds a collar and sells their output for $4. So they've added $1 in value and so on. For what it's worth, all three ways of calculating GDP should agree and reinforce each other. But like I said, C plus I plus G plus NX, that's the big one. All right, so GDP is a super useful measurement. And like I said, it's probably the granddaddy of macro measurements. And nobody wants to say it, but sometimes granddaddy ain't everything he used to be. This lesson is about pointing out those flaws and limitations of GDP. So we know that GDP measures how much stuff an economy is producing, but does a higher GDP in one country necessarily mean that people in that country are richer? Well, not so fast. For one thing, we need to consider the size of the population. For example, if we only look at GDP, it's obvious that country A has a larger economy. But we need to know each country's population so that we can get a better idea of the standard of living in each country. In this case, it turns out that the two countries are China and Denmark, and they have dramatically different populations. As a result, GDP per capita is a much more useful measurement of a country's standard of living. As you can see, it paints a quite different picture. Now we can see the average income per person in the country. And with this measurement, the average person in Denmark earns about six times the average person in China. Big difference. But even this has its flaws since it doesn't account for income distribution. Two countries could have basically the same GDP per capita, but one may have a more unequal distribution than the other. So you still don't quite know what the standard of living is like for the average person. And since we're taking the average or mean, this number can be hugely skewed by outliers, further weakening that concept of average. Another weakness of GDP is comparing some things that are counted towards GDP and other things that don't count. So basically, GDP counts lots of bad things and it fails to account for non-market transactions. If it's not bought or sold, it doesn't matter how great it is, it ain't adding to GDP. There are a few other things that don't add to GDP, and I should probably point those out right about now. Used goods don't add to GDP since they've already been bought and sold before, so they've already contributed to GDP. And government transfers do not count as government spending because the government is merely transferring money to somebody, and they don't receive a good or service in return. So if the Defense Department buys a bunch of bombs, it counts as government spending, and it adds to GDP because they, the government, received a good, a bad, in return. But a social security check to grandma does not add to GDP because there was no good or service being exchanged. Additionally, money earned from financial investments like stocks and bonds or selling ownership of a company does not add to GDP either. There's no good or service being exchanged. 
All right, so there's your intro to our big three of macro variables. Now let's get into more detail in each of them in the rest of the unit. So until next time, this has been a La Money production. Thanks again for watching. Please hit that like button and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Make sure to check out the description to get answers to these practice questions on the screen right now, as well as the great study aids like AP Macro and 250 that I've made for you. And I will see you in the next video.